and please acknowledge after starting the recording please it's done thank you very very much good morning everyone uh, thanks for joining this codathon intelligent automation track session 2 so we had our first session on april 4th and this is our second session please do remember um, this particular track is bi weekly i did see some of them joining last week uh, just a reminder to everyone this is bi weekly so the next session is going to be on may 2nd 10:30 am okay and from the logistics point of view there are few things that i would like to share it with you before i leave the floor to krishna the first thing is all the recordings of our kodathon sessions is available in the youtube i have sent the link in the chat window so you should be able to access them uh, compared to the last um, kodathon to now we have 22 subscribers that's good news last time we had close less than uh, Uh, 10 subscribers so so there's more and more subscribers are subscribing and and watching the videos that gives us uh, immense uh, happiness that uh, people are uh, you know uh, learning that's that's what we want uh, everyone to do thank you very much and then the second thing is we have a github right now uh, it is not an organization it is created under testoper we are working with github to create an organization Uh, for us and uh, and give access to all our members so it's not yet done so until that time um, what you can do is you can go to this github and inside the github normally we store the codes right uh, like for example in the in the beginner track we are doing some python exercises and stuff like that so all the codes are stored here and even for this session we will also store the code here so anything to do with the code is stored in this github and this is the location and then third thing is temporarily right now we are using this testopor kodathon uh, whatsapp probably probably we will continue to use this for next one or two months but eventually we will uh, uh, stop using this so my recommendation is if you are already in the microsoft teams and you are already able to collaborate and you are good with microsoft teams and if you do not want to or wish to be in whatsapp you are free to leave the whatsapp you know it it doesn't make sense because you are already collaborating in the microsoft teams and you don't really need uh, whatsapp anymore right so feel free to exit if you believe you are good with uh, ms teams feel free also to stay for next two months um, uh, if you if you think you wanted to stay the choice is yours okay but uh, after a couple of months most probably we will not have whatsapp then the fourth point is we have even bright um, and in even bright there are all the programs that you can see i kindly request you to go and register for these programs um next week is very special week for uh, testoper community because we have a meet up our first first virtual meet up will be doing in the same medium and i expect every one of you to join please do not forget and the meet up starts at 10 am if you have not registered it please register it and make sure before registering it you have not registered it before because i have seen lot of duplicate registrations um my kind request is to register it only once and this is very special for us uh, because we are going to ta talk about a topic uh, which is called as the new era of automation with industry 4.0 it will and, and more specifically within that uh, industry 4.0 we would be talking about iot it would be very very useful for you all to understand this picture overall picture about uh, industry 4.0 and how iot plays a critical role in industry 4.0 from the technology point of view and uh, how automation is going to help uh, and critical to to make this industry 4.0 uh, successful in the form of uh, digital transformation so it's a very very important session for testoper and i also believe it's a very important session for you guys to join and learn a big picture and we have three interesting speakers from uh, microsoft from tech mahindra and also from bell they are all high profile speakers and uh, and and uh, you know a good uh, Uh, senior executives so it's it's an opportunity to learn a big picture of uh, this technology in next week uh, uh, test over meet up i kindly urge you to go and uh, register this and please join us next week at 10 am then the fourth thing is little bit about microsoft teams if you see here in microsoft teams um 
there is a there is a different channel once you are in the microsoft teams this is a nice place because moving forward we are going to use microsoft teams for everything because it provides everything in one place thanks to microsoft for for uh, you know uh, helping us and spos sponsoring us on this particular uh, usage of the tool as a non profit um, so in this tool uh, you know once you have access to it you will you will be able to see this and there are different channels you can go into the respective channel depending upon which event you are attending and you can uh, collaborate with uh, with others uh, so here there are a couple of things that i wanted to specify with respect to the testo per codathon the first thing is in this in this community there is a channel called testo per codathon so if you click that testo per codathon channel there is a tab here called files if you click that files there are three tracks here so right now we are um, uh, running this ia track uh, krishna is presenting and he'll be presenting to you today uh, his session, second session and inside this ia track you would see the presentation so if you wanted to get the presentation what is being presented this is the place to go okay if you wanted to revisit the video because you missed something when krishna was explaining youtube is the place to go okay and if you wanted to look at coding github is the place to go then finally um, in uh, in testoper community there is uh, something called as general here here there is a files and then if you go to faq so here i have there is a document which explains how to register and join ms teams so you are all in the uh, different medium slack uh, you know whatsapp and everywhere if someone is having trouble please uh, do help us to point this document to that person so he is able to get into this microsoft teams so i like to also ensure that uh, i i repeat this so if you look at the codathon program today so in this place um, you can actually you know this is the place that uh, i have joined and after joining if you actually see the participants here i can tell you very clearly the the guest is written in the second line below the participant name all those participants chetan guest right um, then jarvis guest uh, jose george guest so all the people who have joined as guest have not created the microsoft uh, teams account with testoper community that is why you see like this and those people today in in today's session will not be able to ask question through the chat so if you wanted to ask questions please use use whatsapp for today and make sure in our in your next session you you do it right uh, so you are able to ask questions through the uh, microsoft chat window all right and finally um, there is a links that i have sent today all whatever that i discussed with you guys all the links that i have sent uh, today like here in our chat youtube link GitHub link for code, WhatsApp link, even Bright link. Please register for our uh, meetup. Uh, then uh, how to join Testoper in FAQ and all the presentations related to the Codeathon. All the links are present here. So that ends my uh, logistics uh, communication with you all for today. With that, I will leave the floor to Krishna to um, start the session. Krishna, over to you. Um, before that, Asha, do you want to share something? or uh, sorry krishna uh sada sada has joined yeah, i think he wanted to share a couple of uh, inputs before we start yeah no krishna i think you can definitely start what i'm going to do is while you are talking i'm going to monitor the question answers whatever people are asking on the chat and yes. whenever you're taking your break i'm going to voice out those questions and if at all i know some answers which are easy out there i'm going to reply on the chat itself and uh, and towards the end of it what i've done is i've created a couple of links which is basically the azure fundamentals course and the azure kubernetes services course uh, which is there in microsoft learn i'm going to share it towards the mid or towards the end of the session for everyone to have access to the material that you're sharing so uh, we'll take care of it while you as and when during your presentation okay thank you awesome thank you thank you and and i also like to uh, make sure adarsh uh, you know the team whoever is joining today just don't join today learn today and then you know uh, you know just just kind of sit idle right i really want you guys to come to the channel microsoft team channels that we have and i really want all the att attendees to ask questions answer questions and keep this engagement very active that is the only way you know we all can be successful learning so we are all here today uh, not for money like any other profit organizations we are all here for today to learn and become a creative talent each one of us so i just want to make sure that you take this forum whatever the effort that we have been putting in to deliver the session but also offline 
continue to communicate with the trainers, learn stuff, and also the experts from the attendees and learn stuff. That's the only way we can all be successful. All right, uh, Krishna, sorry to hijack again. Over to you. No problem at all. Uh, hopefully, everybody on the call can hear me. So yeah, we, can, we can hear you, Krishna, but there's some uh, break in your voice. I just want to make sure it's not only me. Yeah, it's yeah, breaking. Yeah, it's breaking. Then just give me one second. Is it better now? Yes. At it least to me, yeah. it's better. Yeah, it's yeah it is better. What I done is I logged in via my, the Teams or the the web. So I had two team session. The one I'm logging is through my own account. So that's why. It is. So we are good to go now. Uh, so before I start, I really want to just uh, run through the previous week's uh, session where we spoke about introduction to. I think it's basically about the principles of the cloud computing. What are the key elements that forms the cloud computing? Um, mostly towards uh, what is uh, capital expense, what is operational expense, and then we followed by um, how does cloud work in terms of the infrastructure availability sets and other, those sort of uh, infra level things. So this week, uh, what I've done is um, I'm going to focus on three key important topics. Uh, that is pertaining to the cloud. So we'll start with um, the compute. So basically, um, I would call compute as the key uh, engine that is going to run your workloads, irrespective of uh, whether it's database, it's services, doesn't matter. Compute are basically the CPU and the storage and the memory that, that you use to process your, um, your workload specifically. And then the next topic, I will just slightly go towards deep into Kubernetes. Uh, the reason I'm bringing Kubernetes is there's a there's a very strong relationship between the con compute and the Kubernetes world. So I'm going to go deeper into it a little bit, and then I'll finish. So hopefully by the time we 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 could cover the networking session. On this on the same note, I'll also uh, jump into the Azure portal. I will create a, a simple virtual machine to using UI so that you get some experience on how to uh, you know use the Azure portal and things like that. So this is going to be um, a lab as well as uh, concepts. The concepts are very deep here. So today we, maybe if you have any questions, feel free. So there's also question time. I specifically once I finish each section, um, I will open up the floor. Uh, to ask uh, so that you have an opportunity to ask your questions so uh, I can answer during that time as well. So I'm going to get jump. Please feel free to, um, I think, get you all your questions in one go so there'll be enough time for the questions as well. And Krishna, just to keep it very streamlined, uh, everyone who has a question, you can keep posting it on the chat window so that whenever Krishna stops for question time, that time we can address one question at a time. And we'll do about five to 10 minutes of Q&A and jump back to what Krishna is supposed to be doing, just to ensure that we abide by the timelines of the meeting of two and a half hours. Okay. Thank you, Adarsha. So, so just to give you an overview of Azure services, you know, so, if you think about Azure, it's it's the entire platform of multiple different services that all work together to give a single, uh, I would say, view of uh, any sort of system that you want to build in. So usually uh, the way you would see uh, Azure is it's basically multiple chunks. OK, so we call them as first and the left hand side, you can see security. So the reason I start with security is one of the fundamental facts of the computing world is uh, security forms the basis of everything you are building right now. As an example, uh, when you log into any system, you enter you enter a username and password, um, and then only you're authenticated. And then you once you get authentication into the service, then you can go into doing the activities you're supposed to be doing. Like it's very similar to you have a website where you log in username and password, and then once you log in, you're going to do the things you want to do there. So an Azure, Azure is ground, it's built with ground up with a very strong security fundamental. Um, so if you, we might heard of Azure Active Directory, which is the identity provider. On top of that, uh, Azure also provides you with things like um, role-based access control. What we mean by role-based access control is 
every single resource in Azure should have a role associated to it. Only then you will be able to access the given resource. So, for example, if you are if you're hosting a virtual machine, you should be assigned a role that you can operate on the virtual machine. So it's a very strong security governance on it. So if you think about that, there are multiple different layers of security we have within Azure. So that's one of the reasons I'm going to cover a networking is how those things are going to work to or, uh, together work to give you a single unified view of how to access the services. On the right hand side, if you see we have platform services, platform services where the core engine I call. So there are multiple different types of services like compute, uh, containers and batch and you know DevOps. Uh, if you think about it, so if you think about these, the, the, the platform services are where you're going to build your, your applications using multiple different services within the platform services. For example, if we, every single service should have some sort of a data storage, as an example, can, it can be a NoSQL or SQL type. So we have different types of uh, data services within Azure. So one could be a SQL database, which is a traditional database. We also have Cosmos DB, which is your uh, NoSQL type uh, database. And one interesting thing with Cosmos DB is uh, you can write your application code in, in Cassandra or uh, Mongo or any type of APIs, it'll uh, Cosmos DB can actually work with those APIs to give a very similar uh, work use and feel of a traditional um, uh, NoSQL database. On top of that, we also have cognitive services, and we also have Azure Machine Learning Bot service as well as analytics. So if you can see, the spectrum of platform services within Azure is extremely wide. Um, so at the same note, this is a very small subset of it. And one key piece of everything is developer developer services. What we mean by that is, um, if you heard of Visual Studio Code, which is uh, one of the uh, IDE, which is extremely popular. So people need to write the code and upload the code. So GitHub is another repository we provide as part of the developer services. So we, if, that gives you a ability to um, customize, extend Azure to your own specific needs to address your business uh, requirements. On the right hand side, uh, this is where the hybrid comes into play. So if you think about uh, last week, we spoke about uh, any type of system, especially when you're building enterprise class system, there's always an on-premises component, which is hybrid. Uh, some of the information systems or security or compliance and audit or databases might and will reside on on-premises. So at the same time, you, you want to expand your cloud footprint. What you do is that's where the hybrid services come into play, where it will gives it becomes your um, bridge between your on-premises system and the, and the cloud to give a single flow for you as a customer to all to work with. So for example, if you think th things like for um, Azure Site Recovery is a product where you still have your on-premises system. Um, but if you want a DR capability on cloud, you would use something like an uh, Azure Site Recovery, where your primary uh, deployment, your primary data center is always on prem, but at times of a disaster, you want to extend to Azure. That's where the DR comes into play. Uh, at the same time, we also have uh, domain services, which means your Active Directory or identity can live on prem. At the same time, you need to have extended to the cloud. So this is, if you think about uh, these three key pieces, the security and the platform service and the hybrid cloud would form a major, the ba uh, top layer of your uh, of your cloud uh, uh, ecosystem. The, what's interesting is the, the infrastructure service, the underlying, you know, uh, things which makes these things possible are a couple of key things. One is I'll start with networking. So networking is one of the fundamental, I would say, core services that will make all those components work together. Uh, so if you talk about and think about networking, it's not only the connectivity between different services, it also gives you things like uh, if, you, if you're building a large scale web application, if you have millions of users connecting to the service, you need to have a load balancer, right? A very massively scalable load balancer. So, for example, if you're building a website which is, needs to be accessed from around the world, then things like traffic manager comes into play, right? At the same note, uh, you also want very secure connectivity between your on-prem and Azure. Um, so, how do you do that? By express route. So, basically, express route is a direct connectivity between your on-premises data center to Azure through a private link. You know, it's extremely secure private link. At the same time, some companies want to do a you know VPN. So we provide 
very extensive networking services. So as a customer, you have multiple ways to connect to Azure in the best secure possible way. So that's key things to know. And the storage is very key as well, right? Because you have to store your information, you have to store your data somewhere. Um, so this is not like a database storage, but underlying fabric storage systems. So we have different types of storage systems. Uh, one is the blob, which is the binary large objects, the queues and the tables, and the disks, the disks are pretty traditional uh, virtual machine disk, right? So that's very, very key. And Microsoft is one of the top providers of that. So we built a very new storage system to cater the cloud scale needs because in the cloud scale, the, the, the scale is extremely different than traditional system, right? If a disk on a, on a on-premise, a disk can fail, but uh, most likely you might have put a new disk. In the cloud world, when you're running millions of services, it's not possible, right? So we build a brand new storage system on it. And the last piece is compute, right? So compute is basically your virtual machine as Kubernetes. So this forms the, uh, I would say, the platform services overlay. So what gives you is, as an Azure, as you can see, it gives you a full end-to-end -end ecosystem of services that's available to you to build and work and anything that you want to uh, host your applications, Azure gives you that single frame of class. Um, what we'll start to do is we'll go deep into uh, compute services, um, which, is, uh, which basically means in this scenario is virtual machines, uh, scale sets and app services and functions. So virtual machines, I think we spoke last time, it's um, very straightforward uh, virtual machine where you want to create uh, a single machine uh, or multiple machines that will could host your workload. Scale sets are uh, other service where uh, it's designed. Traditionally, what happens is you have a static infrastructure where you build a virtual machine that will stay there forever. Um, if you need to upgrade or increase um, the throughput, you end up adding more machines to that or increase the capacity of the machine. You basically, you scale vertically or you scale horizontally, um, but that's not a very efficient way to do on the cloud. The VM scale sets uh, are basically a, a service where based on the telemetry of these services, the, the virtual machines can scale out horizontally uh, based on the demands of the workload. For example, you might host a website and the website has to scale out. That's where the scale sets comes into play. We are based on, let's say, for example, if a million requests comes into this particular server, uh, the system knows it cannot handle the million requests. What it'll do is it will add machines into that horizontally uh, so that the workloads can be handled. And app services are basically, you might hear quite a bit of this pass platform as a service. So platform as a service is uh, at one level up than the scale sets and virtual machines where it gives you a single unified uh, uh, component that you run that you need to run your web, web applications. For example, you might heard of web, uh, WordPress, you might heard of uh, websites, you know. Traditionally what happens is you build your individual component, like you build a web server component, you build your scaling component as individual ones, but web server app services gives you a single unified uh, um, platform where it's, for example, if you build a web, if you want to build a WordPress site, you don't need to build into your components. You automatically go and build the web or WordPress asset is and Azure would manage that. And the last one is functions. So basically, uh, you might heard of a thing called event um, models, event triggers, event based systems. Where what happens is, to give a very simple example. Traditionally, customers would buy the boxes, servers, put that into the website, into the public cloud. And for example, if you're hosting a, a website which is based to, which is used to upload pictures, you know, uh, usually what happens is you run the infrastructure constantly, and then you don't know when somebody's going to host the picture. So at that time, you're still spending money on that infrastructure, but uh, you just you are wasting the resources because you just don't know when somebody is going to launch the website to host the picture, right? So this function is basically is based on triggers. So imagine a scenario where uh, a user comes in, he uploads that picture, and he, he may, when he does that event, the systems know that I need, it has to provide a certain compute and storage to start storing that picture. So basically, any these are functions are basically, think about, they react to an event, which means your cost of operation is very minimal. And then when the event finishes, you basically, you go down, there is nothing to it. The very simple use cases, for example, classic use case they always tend to give is, um, 
um, let's say if you take Olympics as an example, right? So Olympics happens every four years, but at the time during the Olympics, you might have a lot of huge volume of transactions. Once the Olympic finishes, the entire infrastructure is totally not use, useful, right? So those type of scenarios where you have an immediate spike and you don't want to provision anything pre-provision, you tend to use functions as one of the compute uh, use cases and then go from it. So this is the full end-to-end -end picture of uh, the compute services. I'm going to um, go into the containers. Before that, I really want to go into Azure portal to show you guys how these things are organized so that at least you get a feel for Azure. So just let me know if you can see the screen. Um, can everybody see my screen, Azure screen? Hey, yeah. Yes, we can, yes, we can see that. Yeah, we can see Krishna. Okay. Krishna, can uh, can the attendees also um, do it in parallel uh, when when you're doing it? Is is this possible? As machines and things like that. Uh, could you help them how to create the accounts and stuff like that uh, as well? So I will send a link for it because here, uh, as you uh, the, what happens is you can create a sample account or get test account, uh, which has which gives you a two hundred fifty dollars worth of uh, credits. So they can always enroll for a free uh, trial and then they can uh, go and log on and do that as well. So this is, I think I shared a link last week uh, so where they can uh, go ahead and enroll themselves for the free subscription. And also uh, for future purposes, uh, above I have pasted the link, which is basically courses on Microsoft Learn. If at all you do these fundamental courses on Microsoft Learn, it has exercises involved, wherein a sandbox environment gets created to practice some of these for which you do not need to create a new account. You do not need to add your credit card details. It's all within the Microsoft Learn platform. So uh, yeah, so that's, if at all you go to Microsoft Learn, do Azure fundamental courses, whichever exercises are involved, it creates a sandbox environment for you to actually do those courses. Should, should we not explain that, uh, you know, how to do that uh, as a part of this program so they can offline start working on that, right? Okay. So, yeah, we'll do that towards the end, Krishna, because I don't think it's uh, like if at all you're just showing it right now. Um, yeah, but, but I'll let you answer the question, Krishna. Sorry, go ahead. No, I think, uh, okay, so let me go back here, right? So if you go to the, this, I will we already shared the link last week. So when you go into, uh, for example, uh, this Azure Fundamentals, right? There is a specific section that talks about creating an Azure account, okay? And there's also one exercise which talks about how to create the free account. If you follow the steps, uh, you are basically get a, a trial uh, access so that once you can have the trial access, then you can you do all your labs. That's what I did. All I did is I went to the Azure portal and then created a uh, trial account. That's, you see my account here, it's called uh, Learn Cloud 2020, that's my account. So it will ask you uh, most likely for a credit card for authentication purposes, not for charging. Uh, so once you have that, you have you can start working on all the exercises. Is it clear? Yeah, it's clear, clear, Krishna. And uh, those exercises uh, that that's mentioned there. Yep. Um, what's your plan? Are you uh, going to ask the attendees to do it offline, or are you going to walk them through uh, here? Uh, how, how is that you, you plan to? So the whole idea of exercises. These are uh, if you look at these exercises. Okay. So the uh, the, uh, the feedback I want to give to the attendees is so these are step by step instructions on how to create. Uh, the given uh, resource in question. For example, if I take the WordPress site as an example, okay? So it will give you step-by-step -step where to go and create it, how to create it, what are things you can do, right? So it's very self-explanatory in terms of uh, the uh, the labs. So the reason is these are lots and lots of labs available here. So it's not possible to run through. I can run through, uh, navigate, help you them to navigate and get them started on uh, the basic stuff. But these examples are available for the attendees to go and try out themselves. That it's easier for them. It's not if you, if you follow the step by step. So what we have done is uh, from the Microsoft Learn, we made it very easy for anybody to go and follow the step by step instructions and then go from it. So today I'm covering, say for example, the compute concept, right? I'm compute. I'm covering virtual machines, containers, 
um, and also a little bit of app services. All they need to do is go to this section each individually and then walk them through. There's also additional exercises and additional materials within um, this particular uh, session so they can actually walk it through. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Maybe yeah. what we could do is others offline, maybe we can give to the attendees. These are all the two things that you should do it before coming to the next session so that, you know, uh, there is a continuity, keeping them engaged offline on that. Yeah, I think the whole idea of this, I think uh, it goes with what we're saying, right? So in the cloud, see there are two things on the cloud when you, when you start learning cloud. Okay, so just clicking here to create a resource is not a challenge. Anybody could do it, but why? Understanding the underlying thing is very, very fundamentals of why does a load balancer work like this? What is the difference between uh, uh, Azure load balancer with layer four and layer seven, right? What is a traffic manager, right? So if you don't understand that basic concept is going to be tough. So creating the resource is one of the easiest thing to get into because it's all fully UI based. But understanding the fundamentals, why containers are better than uh, virtual machines, those are things. That's what we cover on the sessions. But hands-on labs, there are basically if they follow what's in the uh, our training material, which they can basically cover most of the stuff, right? Because some of the training also takes time. It takes at least uh, 30, 40 minutes to run through. So we will send the link. I think our last week I shared the link already. All they need is a trial account and then starting to do exercises. So if, if this week, if we cover the compute uh, session, one of the exercises in the next two weeks, what they should do is uh, do the compute and then any questions. Uh, I will also st start sharing quizzes. Any questions they should be putting into the, uh, you know, the chat channel so that we can respond to them as they go along. Awesome. Sounds like a great plan, uh, Krishna. It is 50% on theory, practical. Th this whole idea of my session, our sessions on the Saturdays is for them to teach the concepts, um, tell them the basics of why this is working like this, but hands-on labs, they can always try it, right? Yes, yes. Maybe, yep. you know, to kickstart, maybe a couple of things you can um, uh, show them. Uh, once they get used to how to do it, uh, then I think, uh, you know, it's, it's fair to expect from us that they would do it. Uh, before coming to the next session and also we should set a target before coming to the next session these are all the three links that uh, from the microsoft azure portal you should have clicked gone through learned you know something like that we can uh, we, we can do i think okay. that's a very good idea yeah, yeah. so uh, so in, in uh, so just to touch base on that so this week we are covering the the azure compute options okay so one of the, the I would say, take a, the homework or you know uh, things to do is exp start doing the samples that are provided in this particular section, and then walk through and and do a test deployment of it. Okay, so that's the whole thing. So with that in place, uh, I, I I'm not sure how many have seen the Azure portal. Um, so this is the, we call this is the Azure portal. This is where uh, the resources that uh, you need for your work or line of business or deployments, this is where you're going to start it. So we also covered last week a concept of resource. Um, what we mean by resource, it's basically uh, a single unit of work that you need for your, uh, for your activity to be done. So in this case, when you talk about resource, we always go and you know, let's say a, a virtual machine, you know, which is very commonly known as uh, VMs. Um, so in this scenario, we can customers can we can go and create a virtual machine to host some sort of a workload. So if you look at compute, if you click on the left hand side, you're going to see virtual machine, SQL Server, uh, Kubernetes Server, you know, Service Fabric uh, functions. So these we call it resources. So if you click on what is a virtual machine, what you're going to get is a screen to go and create the particular resource in question. So um, each one resource would have a resource group, which means this is, I think the last week we also talked uh, talked about resource group. So which means this is a container which is going to host this particular resource in question and the resource should also have a name. Or some name and region we talked about region as well because uh, uh, if you see Azure we keep uh, it is available in more, over 54 55 regions depending on uh, uh, how we are at this point in time so we go and create a infrastructure on this scenario 
So we, we choose the type of operating system that you want to create. Uh, so in this case, you know, as you can see, there's Windows 10 uh, and Windows Server as well. Um, and then you basically, you can also go and uh, choose the type of administrators you want to create. So basically in this scenario, all you end up doing after this exercise, you end up having a virtual machine that is basically based on a Windows operating system that is hosted on Canada Central in this scenario. So let me go and select it. So size is where the type of machine, you know, what type of machine you want to create. So the type is one of them. So let's see what types are available. I think it, it gave a message saying that for Canada, this is not available in the earlier page. Well, okay, fine, fine. Yeah, I know why. So there are being few. Let me see which other regions. Thanks. For uh, that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's good to uh, choose the East, um, the Central US, right? There's yep. the East as well, East region, um, Canada East. I think Canada is, uh, okay, I know why it is because of the. Uh, COVID only enterprise customers are allowed to, uh, yeah. to create the machines. Okay, thanks for that. East to us too. Yeah. Just to be available. Hey, Krishna, one question to you. Um, have you explained about the resource group? Like, what's the purpose of having the resource group? I think I I, I touched okay. this on last week, but I'll uh, I'll run it again. So once I finish this creation, when the creation is happening, I'm going to explain to them. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. Just give me thanks. That's a good point. Um. So just to give you an example here, uh, the subscription is where uh, each uh, Azure resource can live in a subscription, right? Subscription is think about your uh, boundary where um, it's got a certain types of uh, resources. The limit, uh, there are a lot of resources that can be deployed. Subscription is your boundary of the resource that where it's going to live. The second one is resource groups are basically Think about resource groups or it's, it's a resource group is a collection, will hold a collection of resources. It could be compute, networking, storage, uh, you know, um, the past services, databases into a single group. So think about most of the time if you have line of business, you know, and if your line of business got finance, within finance, you might receivables and payables as an example, right? In this case, if you want to build an application for receivables, you might build a resource group specifically for them. It gives you a couple of things. It gives you a, a building methodology as well as it also gives you some auditing capabilities too, right? Uh, on the same note, uh, when you come at instance details, this is where where you're going to create the virtual machine. The region is very key. Um, so in this case, uh, today I'm hosting my workload in kind of US East too. Uh, and also, uh, I think last week he spoke about uh, uh, the high availability options, for example, I, uh, we have two key cho choices within Azure. One is availability zones and availability sets. Availability sets are basically within the same data center. Uh, your workload can be hosted on three uh, multiple different availability sets. We have um, three uh, as a maximum, so which means think about three different racks. This workload can be hosted from a high availability perspective. And available zones also, uh, these are mini data centers within the same region that if you want a higher availability than availability sets, you can use availability zones. Um, most importantly, size of the virtual machine, right? Um, the charging for your machine happens to what size you pick. Um, there are different variations into it. A D series would have a different uh, type of CPU versus uh, N series, which is a GPU based, right? So depending on it, um, obviously there's also administrator account. Uh, what account you will use to log into that particular um, server or machine you're creating it, and also port rules. Uh, we're going to touch base on this on our load balancer. This is what I'm saying, right? So when you're creating a virtual machine, uh, you also need to uh, let somebody access that machine. Uh, what sort of protocol you're going to enable into it, whether you're going to enable RDP protocol or whether you're going to enable SSH, uh, it's also very key. Um, so at time, if you can see here, there is a HTTP, which is uh, your uh, HTTP port, which is uh, if you're hosting a website, most likely you'll use HTTP because that's secure. Uh, SSH is basically Linux based uh, uh, mechanism to log into the machine uh, and RDP is remote desktop. 
uh, it's a it's a windows based stuff so depending on what you'll do you're going to do that um so the licensing also plays a major role if uh, this is mostly used for our customers who have existing windows licenses they can get the value of the existing licenses by choosing this flag um so this is we are creating a simple krishna i'm sorry to interject out can you just go back to the previous screen once let's yeah. go back um there was a question around horizontal and vertical scaling so if yep. you can just go back to the sizing yep. and tell get, explain to some of the people out here as to what does it mean to horizontally scale or vertically scale i think just clear the picture completely fantastic question so for example if you see uh, the vm size you know let's say I start with the a, a1 v2 okay so when you have a1 v2 it has got a specific type of cpu ram and a disk okay so this is like your entry point so for example you host a website you starting with the a1 v2 but um, you you what are you finding out the machine is very strained during a peak workloads so what you end up doing is you resize the machine to a higher tier basically you keep adding um, capacity to the existing server by adding basically the same machine but you keep more uh, you increasing that uh, size of the machine to the higher tier basically you you start with uh, a1 v2 and then you go to a2 v2 and then you go into the a2 m v2 basically as you can see you are uh, you can see that the biggest difference uh, one is the 2 gb ram uh, second is 4 gb ram other one is 16 gb ram right so this is what we call horizontal scaling think about like you know horizontal scaling of the servers so that it the server has got more compute more ram to process the workflow on the same note and horizontal scaling has got a limitation right you cannot scale over a certain period of time right after so in this scenario after a8 uh, mv2 you the maximum cpu can have is uh, eight uh, vcpus and then the maximum 64 gb is the ram at the maximum right so what if you need more what you do is that's a, that's where um, um, uh, sorry uh, i think i mixed the mix though that's where the, you can start to add uh, more and more nodes into it so what you can do is you can have five machines of uh, a4 vm2 which means these five machines can sit behind a load balancer to start getting the request for processing so if you think about uh, the previous i think i mixed the concept one is when you talk about the first concept i want to mention is the vertical scaling which means you can have vertically scale the servers to higher capacity at the same time the horizontal scale is meaning you can actually add more machines to process the same workload i'll give you a very simple example so if you having a website which is processing uh, um, orders as an example right what happens is uh, you can process the same order using multiple servers which means from the customer perspective the orders get processed very fast but you are scaling out horizontally which means uh, multiple machines can do the same job but from a customer point of view they will get the uh, messages results faster because you're processing into you're spreading the job into multiple different smaller chunks to process it um, this is where uh, one of the concept you'll see is load balancer so load balancer plays a major role a request will come to the load balancer and the and the what the load balancer will do is you'll take the request and then give it to one of the available machines to process it so is it clear horizontal scaling means you scale out um, so into a single plane you have multiple machines do the same job uh, you can able to have split the work into multiple smaller chunk vertical scaling where you can basically increase the compute and, and memory and ram capability of the machine to increase the size of the machine so that you can process more so most customers adopt two models uh, most of the time uh, so they will sometimes use uh, databases are known to have vertical scaling traditional databases not the cloud databases if you take oracle uh, you you always need to add more memory more ram for the server to optimally perform on on workloads which needs to be which is very uh, stressful on websites web servers most of the time will have a scale horizontally If, it, if it's not clear, let me know. Um, so initially, I think... Uh... Hey, hey, Krishna, I have a one more point too on top yes. of that. Whatever you said is totally makes sense. And uh, especially if you have any worker uh, nodes, uh, it's a good idea to have a horizontal scaling. So you have the multiple workers node. Like the horizontal literally is a clone of the each of the machine 
automatically it's put the clone of the identical mission and you can parallelize the job into multiple missions. Yep, that's, that's a good a, point as well, yep. So uh, I'm going to create a virtual machine quickly here. Test. Uh, so Krishna, why, uh, maybe a question. When to choose vertical scaling and when to choose horizontal scaling, pros and cons? So that's totally depending on the type of uh, workload you're running, right? Traditional databases, okay? If, you, if you're running a SQL Server, if you're running a, a Oracle databases, uh, you, you, have, you have to choose uh, vertical scaling. There's no other way. That's why if you have, if you take old pieces of software, right? Like you know traditional pieces of software, like you know IBM or the world where they always you need to keep adding more compute and memory and RAM. So that's the traditional. On the all the new workloads, like you know for example, if you want to process uh, anything uh, at at cloud scale, you always go with, uh, with the with the concept of um, horizontal scaling. It depends on the application specifically. Modern databases, modern application all go through uh, horizontal scaling. Vertical scaling is not pretty much used these days because it's you're going to spend more on time and money. You always have uh, horizontal scale. Okay, okay. So, you know, we, we actually have uh, started within the Testopor community inside this Microsoft Teams called as Technology Teaser, Weekly Technology Teaser. And last, uh, uh, technology teaser that we were discussing was what's the difference between uh, monolithic and microservice based architecture. So is it um, is it fair to say that uh, monolithic architecture architecture, which is the legacy architecture is probably because it's not designed to work in uh, multiple uh, nodes. Uh, it's, it's better to go for uh, vertical scaling and the monolithic based architecture, which is designed to, you know, do it in nodes and stuff like that uh, future architecture. It's better to go in the in the form of um, uh, you know uh, horizontal scaling, where the containers and all those things comes into the picture. Is it fair to say that? I don't think so. I think I, I um, Krishna, if you want, I can answer the question. Oh, please okay. go ahead. Yeah, there are two ways you can handle it. Like there are two pieces, right? One is a web application, other one is a database. As Krishna mentioned, it database it's going to be going to horizontal, but the web application you can still go to the horizontal. You can add the more nodes clone off, even though it's a monolithic application. Um, so the web app, like a front-end perspective, you can go to horizontal. You can add the n number of VM continuously into load balancer. But on the backend side, the database, it is not possible. You need to be uh, going to the vertical uh, scaling. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But, uh, but in case of, uh, you know, um, microservice architecture, you're going to do stateless, right? So if you're going to do a stateless architecture, uh, is it not uh, uh, better to go with the uh, vertical, sorry, horizontal scale? Because the yeah, the microservice have a more luxury to go to horizontal. For the monolithic, um, we cannot come to the conclusion we have to always go into that uh, vertical unless your application it support one instance. Some of the application I've seen it, it's uh, allow the only one instance. In that case, you don't have a choice. You have to go to vertical. But most, of, even though monolithic application, most of the applications support multi um, uh, multi nodes. Uh, so in the front end perspective, you can go to horizontal. Understood. But on the back end side, the most of the time is a challenge, like a bigger database, like a Oracle. So you need to be at the more memory and CPU to it. So monolithic, horizontal, vertical, depending upon the application. Yep. And uh, and microservices most preferably vertical. Sorry, horizontal. Because, horizontal. Yeah. Uh, horizontal because uh, I, I, of its benefits. Okay. So I got to you. The pricing uh, in terms of pricing, how the vertical and horizontal scaling compares? Can somebody answer? Yep. So the pricing is, you know what? Uh, it's subjective to see. The pricing is depending on your application specifically, okay? So in this case, uh, if you talk about purely, both of them have the pros and cons in terms of pricing, right? Sometimes with the vertical scaling, the pricing is fixed. You know what I mean? So you basically you buy uh, a database server, uh, the you don't, you're not scaling anything, you're just keeping that static, right? Your price is always fixed. On the horizontal scaling, what happens is, um, based on the demand, your costing might vary because, for example, on a peak time, you might have 100 nodes to process in the workload. On non-peak time, you have only two nodes, as an example, right? The pricing is subjective to or mostly towards how the application is architecture and designed versus the, it's not the function of the vertical horizontal scaling, right? 
It depends on how your application is architected towards it. Also, the cloud cost in, in the costing is also takes one key consideration is the, is the license cost too, right? So in this scenario, some cost, some companies do charge more when you want to scale out because for them they they charge by the CPU perspective, and some companies don't care. So it's a pricing is a very subjective. It all depends on your, how your application is architected, how how your application designed. It's not just the related to the uh, uh, horizontal vertical scaling. Uh, on the same note, to talk about monolithic versus uh, non-monolithic architecture, uh, Kader, it's also again monolithic architecture was designed where things are extremely static. Even monolithic architecture will have horizontal scaling when it comes to web services. Okay, anything that can sit behind a load balancer, we call it a horizontally scalable. Monolithic architectures do have that, but one difference in monolithic architecture is everything is installed on the machine versus uh, the state of the web server is stored within that virtual machine versus the state is kept separately on a on a, on a you know on a non-monolithic architecture. So it's again it's the monolithic architecture always had horizontal scaling in between them, right? So, yep. Yep. Pretty clear. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So to move forward. Yeah. Krishna, I, just a little bit of time check. It's uh, been one hour. It's 11.30. We have another hour to go. So, you know, you might want to think about continuing with what you want to cover. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm going to do a sample of the virtual machine here, and then I'll I'll give a break, maybe five, ten minutes, and then we come back, and then we I want to cover a key concept here, Kubernetes, uh, and I wanted to actually give you some detailed explanation on it. So, um, as I mentioned, right, we are, we are cutting a virtual machine. One of the uh, components of the virtual machine is the disk type, right? So there, are, as you can see, there are multiple different types of disks based on the performance requirement of the disk uh, of your workload. You choose the type. So if you if you wonder what is the difference between standard hard disk and standard SSD and premium SSD, it's simple is the IOPS. Um, it's called input output. Basically, a disk has got a read write capability. The higher the read write capability. The, the, the tier changes. In this case, if we talk about standard uh, HDD, which is the hard disk, you might have only 500 IOPS as an example. The higher ones have 10,000 IOPS. You know, one of the homework for you guys is uh, understand about IOPS, IOPS, to under to know uh, how the performance of the disk is determined uh, by the IOPS capability. Most of the time, database type uh, workloads near higher IOPS. Uh, things like uh, web server might need lower IOPS because you're not writing too much read and write. You're using the memory RAM more more in the web servers, but on the data side, you might use more of the disks capabilities here. So you get the disk encryption is very key, right? Uh, at any given point in Azure, by default, everything in terms of data is encrypted by default. You cannot switch it off. We might wonder why it's because that that's one of the security we spoke about earlier on. If you think about the big slide I have, security is the paramount of Azure. Uh, everything, every storage account in Azure is is secured by SHA 256. Uh, so which basically means is one of the highest level of encryption in terms of the public cloud. So you choose, uh, you know, in this case I'm choosing a type of uh, encryption. Uh, I'm going to add into it. Uh, all in do is I'm going to create a virtual machine. Hopefully it will create the VM. Um, and then it's also going to give me a cost of how this, how much this virtual machine is going to, is going to uh, uh, co cost it. So let's wait for a minute. And then I don't want to say anything here. Yes, it's all the validation passed. So if you can you see, this gives a very good summary of the type of the machine. Uh, what region it is there, what type of input, inborn, outborn ports. There's also a lot of information about the management layer, the boot diagnostics, the operating system diagnostic, Azure Security Center. So it gives you a whole bunch of information onto this. One key point I want to mention is if you ever, automation is going to be a key which you will going to cover. Every single thing that you see onto this can be automated using Azure ARM templates. We will talk about it at a later time. So think of one of the things you got to understand is that the cloud is based on automation. So once you hit create, it's going to go and initialize the virtual machine. After the exercise, you will have a VM that is ready for you to work with. So if you're doing this for your practice exercises, what I really suggest is 
uh, once you don't keep any machines running, once you finish uh, your test, delete the machine immediately. Otherwise, you'll be charged for it. In the cloud world, there's nothing called stopping cost. Uh, now I'm, I've created a type of machine D series. There's everything will be charged for the for the machine. So. As you can see, as you was mentioning, it's uh, it's the deployment is underway. Uh, if you want to know what's happening, you can always download the deployment profile. See, one other difference between Azure and the on-premises uh, world is in Azure, every single activity that is ever happening on the resources is audited, uh, both from compliance as well as from troubleshooting perspective. So let's quickly look what's happening here. Uh, if you go into the inputs, it's going to give me the full list of the configuration settings on the outputs as well as the what the template is there. So, so let's wait for another couple of minutes. It's going to be done. In the meantime, I will open the floor to the questions. Uh, so please uh, feel free to post the questions on this one. Um, Krishna, one last question, not one last question. The last question yes. from Novena is, uh, can we set the security groups within VMs? Yes, you can. Yep. So when you, because here I'm, I'm just using a, a single virtual machine, right? So when you set up these machines, you can always come pre-build the security configurations and things like that at, at the base uh, configuration itself so that you can, when the machine gets created, it will have all the base security settings available to you. Excellent. A uh, couple of questions like I was answering while it was going on. So I'm just going to read. So there was one question around when you were showing the different sizes of VMs. One question was asked is, can people custom define their own CPU and RAM and things? I answered it like normally you generally have everything ready, so you will find an option which suits your needs. But I was not sure if at all you have custom ways to define I need two CPUs, 8 GB RAM, if at all it does, that option does not exist. No, basically yeah. the cloud comes with the, we, I call it as a T-shirt sizes. Okay, there's extra, medium, large. Uh, there are pre-built sizes with uh, different types of uh, machines types. So no, you cannot change that. At that, some cloud providers do give that as to get you started off onto the platform. But if you see the reality of it, um, the more you don't want you don't want to be customizing the machine sizes to a specific need of your particular workload. You're better off choosing what is close enough and then let the cloud vendor manage it according to the what is the latest and the greatest. So we don't offer that and then that's not a very good practice because you might, what end up happening, you might over customize to your needs and, and even that becomes a major challenge because when you over customize it, you want to keep it updated on the same configuration no matter what. You're better off choosing the de facto options and then tweak your application to address that need. So short answer is no. Got it. Um, there was a question on RBAC, which we did answer. There was the question was around what kind of roles exist. We basically answered that question by saying, you know, there is owner, contributor, yep. um, reader, and user access. We've already answered that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think those are all the questions. There was a question on horizontal vertical scaling. We answered that. Uh, Reese, yeah, any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, uh, other Shaw, right. in terms of the right. roles, in mm -hmm. terms of the roles, not only the standard role, you can define the custom role based on your organization need. Yep. So as Azure is allowed you to have the custom role, uh, whatever it makes sense and you need it. So that, that's a big one, I think. Uh, I'm, so, I have a question. I'm not very clear about this uh, um, fixed um, uh, capacity of uh, CPU and RAM. Yep. Uh, you just spoke of an ARM template, and with an ARM template, I believe you can, you should be able to customize. I've never used Azure before, but uh, I think if you have a premium account and you are able to use ARM templates, you should be able to um, select whatever RAM you want and whatever memory you want. No, uh, let me uh, right. let us know if that concept is wrong in Azure. You can only have pre-selected uh, stuff. Yep. So very simple, right? I mean, ARM templates basically helps you. Uh, orchestrate the resource deployment. So all the Azure resources are basically pre-built uh, pre or pre-configured for you, okay? So if you go into the, uh, I will give you the calculator, right? So this is the best way to see it. If you want to look at machine types, okay? So what you end up doing is, if you go and say, uh, so these are the pre-built machine types that is available for you to go and choose. So you see the different types of series, A series machines and B series machines and A1 series. So each 
machine type will have a certain CPU, RAM uh, and storage. You can choose only that. You cannot customize to a specific needs. Not on Azure, but I, I know other cloud vendors, these tend to give that. Uh, but in the end of the day, that's uh, you tend to configure to a specific ones. They are not, not on all SKUs. In Azure, you have pre-configured SKUs. Only those SKUs you can use it. But you can configure your storage. You can say, you know what? I want 10 GB of storage. Okay, that's on a blob storage. Uh, you can say certain things you can uh, configure it, but the compute, especially virtual machines, these are pre-built and pre-fabricated for you guys. Thank you. No problem. Uh, Krishna, maybe maybe a you know very name and layman question, right? So yes. I see this uh, like uh, buying a computer, going to a shop, right? So I, yes. I I buy the memory, I buy the CPU, and then um, you know I I find out what is input output that I wanted to use, yep. like you know USB, Ethernet, or whatever, yep. right? Um, yep. So I have a specific question on input output. So you you said IOPS, right? IOPS, yep. I understood input output processing per second, right? Yep. And um, so. You know, from the input and output point of view, uh, it, it, what are all the options that we have, right? Uh, I mean, do we have an option like, can I buy a buy a card which is like one GBPS, ten GBPS, hundred GBPS, uh, you know, bandwidth uh, that I can do I/O? How, how does it? Um, you know, is there anything to select from that point of view, or once I have the VM, I'm I'm good to use any kind of a bandwidth that I want my application to be used? So I think that's a um, let me try and answer that. That's an interesting question because, for example, let's say um, there are two types of storage systems, you know. Um, so one is we call them as a disk storage system, right? So you buy uh, you buy a 13 uh, machine which has got 13 uh, D13, right? So it has got specific configuration. And then in the storage account, you can go and choose a type of disks, okay? Within the disk, there are, there are um, Types of disks which you can choose. Each type has got a certain uh, CP, uh, certain IOPS attached to it. So depending on your uh, virtual machine and processing capabilities, you choose the right type of uh, disk which will give you the right type of IOPS. For example, if you're hosting a database, you will choose the right type of, uh, of uh, storage disk to attach that. On the same note, um, there are things like blob storage. Okay. Blob storage gives you, um, as you can see, 20,000 IOPS per second. Okay, it doesn't matter, but you we give you APIs to write into the blob storage. So depending on the storage system and your workload, you need to choose the right type of storage system to go with it. Does it answer the question? Uh, yeah, this answers partially in the sense uh, it's a communication IO between the the. Uh, app to the database, right? So I'm talking about the IO to from my app to to the customers. Like let's say if I put website yep. and I want to ensure that I have a bandwidth, uh, you know, like normally we go and buy right one Mbps line, right, for okay. our company. So I want to ensure that uh, you know I have always 10 Mbps uh, available for me for for the workload that I for the customers to to access my app. So is there okay. a way to yeah? Yeah, so in this case, that's where uh, in this case, um, I'll give you, I'll paint a simple picture for you. Okay, so you are hosting a virtual, you're hosting a workload, and in the workload, you want to uh, get your customers to coming from the public internet or whatsoever to go and handle the workload, right? That's what you're trying to do. Okay. So that one we call as a bandwidth. So in this case, you you don't need to go on the network or data disk IOPS. You go into the load balancer type IOPS where a request would come to the load balancer that will process the request into the web server. From the web server, you will have a compute layer of some sort to process the in incoming request. So I think you are talking about networking, not on the IOPS level. So within the networking uh, landscape, we have additional things like uh, uh, what do you call? I spoke about um, Express Route, right? That gives you a direct connectivity between on-premises to Azure. There are multiple things we can do within the network set of things to manage it. Understood, understood. Because at the end of the day, any any machine that we have have to have an IP address and talking yep. to other IP addresses in machines, right? So, yeah, I, I think you answered my question. So, on the network side, you have a lot of features that would allow us to. To ensure yep. the connectivity, uh, which is something probably sorry if I have asked this much earlier before you covered that. Okay. No, that's a good question. I think last thing is you know we will talk about networks, right? Virtual networks. 
So each network has got certain capabilities of input and output that they can handle. OK, so if you think about uh, in this case, I'm showing you uh, a virtual network, right? So virtual networks are basically your, your, your network boundary. Uh, your virtual machines will be sitting inside the VNet. So the, the network will have a certain threshold and bandwidth and based on your needs, you can upgrade or de, you can upgrade or downgrade on any current. So that's a good question. So I think as Adarsha mentioned, we are already 1141. Um, maybe if you take 15 minutes, uh, we can, I'll take a break. Uh, anyway, I, I'm going to be uh, here to talk about it. So next chapter, we're going to go into Kubernetes. Uh, details into the containers. So yeah. So, so Krishna, 15 minutes, maybe it's a little too long, right? Five yep. minutes break. Five uh, minutes is good. So, and and okay. so far, yeah, so just to, um, you know, wrap this up. So far, I, I understood that we know how to create the machine, right? Yep. With the settings and, uh, you know, reserve the CPU memory and, and, and things like that. Yep. Um, so so uh, we bought, we know how to buy a machine now, right? So yep. what to do with that machine is something that we need to understand moving forward. Absolutely, yes. All Absolutely, right. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. No problem at all. So you want to switch off the recording or you'll if the questions are coming in, uh, I'm more than happy to answer the questions. So 11.45 we meet, right? Yeah, we'll leave the recording on. We can always chop it uh, afterwards. Yeah. Yep. Krishna, if you're still there or if you're taking a yep. break, that's fine. Okay, so, this, so there was a question around um, from Sonali. I know people are taking a break, but if Sonali is still there on the call, yes. she can listen to you. Um, she was asking about uh, the login details. So I basically told her that, you know, there you can provide your login details with the Windows if it's Linux, it's SSH. She had a question around public private exposing of this, yep. uh, like EC2 does. And she also had a question around um passwordless uh entry if required so if at all you can just give two liners on that it might help her understand the okay. process um so a couple of things right so for example uh very similar uh, the protocol that we use is very straightforward right ssh or uh, rdp depending on the type of uh, machine and these ports can be exposed to uh, a public endpoint I'll, I'll ask, or as private endpoint. Uh, so when you, have, when you create the virtual machine, uh, you can choose to, I will show that to you guys here, uh, choose to show that machine into uh, a public available IP address or a private IP address. So when you create a machine, you can say, you know what, I want this machine to be available only on the private. Then you, you have a, you need to have a, then in that case you need to create a network uh, which will get the machine into your private network. But if you say, you know what, I want to give this a public, you'll have a public endpoint. If you have both options, very similar to other cloud providers. Um, apart from that, um, what are the second question she asked? Hi, Krishna, this is Sanali. Hi. So, hi. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's exactly what I wanted to ask. Like, uh, uh, you know, it, uh, like in default, it will always go to public, right? And if we want to private just to the screen that you were showing, uh yes. we will create a, our own virtual private network and in that virtual private network we will create our machine that will make it a private machine correct Absolutely, yes so each machine mm -hmm. by default will have two ip addresses as you can see you can see my yeah. screen yeah yeah one is a public ip address second one is a private ip, private address. IP address yeah so you can disable that um provided you're able to log into the machine using uh your on premise or you're using a network and also one other option which we have now is Bastion. So hmm. we very similar to the other cloud providers where when you create a Bastion host, hmm. what we mean by that is you can reach out to that machine that we created using a fully um, non-public access into the machine. Mm, can you please say again, like non-public access? So, for example, um, let me explain to you. Is here. it sim sorry, Krishna, uh, to interrupt? Is it similar to Jump Server? Yes, very, very, oh, very. I think I, I did. What's your name? I didn't get your name. 
Navina, this is Navina. Navina, I think you are right. It's a jump server. When you create a jump server, traditionally what happens is you create a machine, you host the machine, and there are a lot of other things in security wise. Right? Bastion is basically it sits within Azure for, uh, Fabric and no public access available. Using Bastion, you can connect to the machine that you created. Exactly right. Okay. It's a service available as a That's service. Install the jump box as a service. Mm -hmm. So that uh, so we'll also have. A Bastion related IP or something, or just that? Yes, internal is the internal IP. If you can see, right, uh, you don't really, you don't need to expose it. So in this case, uh, you will have a similar uh, IP address and everything. Basically, it's a virtual machine, okay? But you can choose to use that machine to connect to your uh, the server you created. Basically, okay. it's a firewall sitting between uh, you yep. outside and the, the box inside. Yep. Yeah, so it's like all the concepts of jump server come into place. Exactly. Uh, the challenge with jump server, as you know, is um, you need to create it, manage it, maintain it, uh, build it. The whole lot of pain points come into play, right? Um, so that's why the Bastion is a much better uh, solution than jump servers. And then one Bastion host can provide you uh, Bastion services for multiple machines. Yes, that's a good point as well. I didn't get your name. What's your name? Uh, it looks to be Partho. Partho. Thanks, Partho. Um, one question from Pankaj. <laughs> Pankaj, I think it's a very broad question. Uh, can you please explain how in real-time world e-commerce companies like Walmart, Best Buy, or big banks, how they may use Azure services? <laughs> so it's uh, it depends what, but Krishna, go ahead. Yeah, That's a good question, Michael, because um, so that's why let me uh, solve the food I have. So uh, let, let's take a very simple example. I don't want to mention names, so I will take an e-commerce side. Let's say, for example, you're running a large-scale um, um, uh, web, web e-commerce site where you host, you're selling stuff. Okay, what happens most of the time is these customer enterprises you would use a couple of key things. Um, the first and foremost, they they will use a huge uh, web service layer of some sort. So anytime you order something, it's going to land on the web server. They also use uh, CDNs, you know, which is content delivery network. So, for example, when you see a picture of a product, those are stored on a massively available uh, storage systems, or we call them content delivery network CDNs, right? So, most of your frequently used uh, images, which will be stored on a CDN, and then these CDNs will tend to live next to the customer's uh, location, right? CDN is one key aspect of it. The main aspect of it is logging information, right? Identity. Um, you need to log in, uh, for example, with username and password, you might have a second fat authentication. That's where they use things like Azure AD, right? Azure AD is what a feature called uh, business, uh, B2C, business to consumer. Uh, you might use, uh, you might be able to use your Google logins, you might use a Facebook login, you might be able to use uh, any uh, third party uh, identity provider. All your login information usually uh, is not stored on a database, it's stored on a very secure provider like Azure AD. So Azure AD plays a major role on that. The CDN is where you frequently used uh, uh, content is stored. And the web services are basically built on cloud scale architecture where they can process millions of hits per second. So it means uh, you customers could would basically uh, hundreds and thousands of customers could log in, but they still have the same experience in terms of uh, um, the product availability and things like that. Once you do that, you have to process orders, right? The processing order usually happens, what happens in the cloud world, they might use things like um, even streaming databases where um, traditional databases are basically based on you, when you you read and write at a, at a sequential, you do one, two, three, four, five, six, um, not parallel read, write. So that's where things like Kafka comes into play or event hubs or some sort of even queuing system comes into play. What happens, all the uh, order comes in, it will put in a queue, you know, the as based on the processing order, it could be first in, first out. Um, you place an order, and the order ought to be processed first. And if somebody else is placing the same order, second, do the process second. So that's where even streaming plays a major role. Um, and also, there's also they do like read caches, write caches. So if you think about it, I'm just giving a very quick rundown. And they need to connect to a payment provider, like you know, they might connect with. Uh, uh, Monaris or any sort of uh, PayPal or Paytm, there's a payment provider processing happens too. The very last minute is um, supply chain, right? They need to go to order database sitting somewhere either on-prem or cloud to find whether the order replaces available there. They might use a backend connectivity there. So 
Um, in order to do that, they need to have um, uh, something like a service bus or bus stock or you know mule soft some sort of um, system which do that. And once you do everything, they need to ship the information, which means they might connect with UPS or uh, or Webex or sorry or, or UPX or you know something like um, FedEx to do that. So um, this is how things work. Uh, most we work with large, 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 large retailers across the world. Um, so this components are basically very similar. Um, I think the key difference you need to understand is uh, most of the e-commerce sites are based on events. Uh, events basically meaning if somebody places order, it puts in an event database. That's a major difference in terms of uh, of this one. And security plays a major role, right? So how do you um, how do you know? that somebody is uh, not uh, building a bot to shut your system down. There's also security plays a major role. That's where we have things like Azure Security Center, which can protect your assets um, uh, very extensively. If you're seeing my screen, you can see things like when I click on security, as you can see, Security Center is the de facto fabric where you have all the um, configurations and security configuration sitting in one place. So that's the whole thing placed in it. I know it's a, I gave a very two months rundown, um, but um, this is, I can, uh, after this, Adarsha, we can send some white papers we have for the e commerce site. Absolutely. So right now I've posted a link around the web architecture for yeah. uh, e commerce. So that will give an idea about how you architect it. But yeah. then, yeah, uh, just being conscious of time, it's 11.50 already. Kubernetes is a beast. <laughs> so uh, no, I, I think uh, you can continue on the next session too. Uh, Krishna, yeah. a quick one for you. Um, yes, sir. I mean, all these rundown that you have done, right? You're going to cover as a part of this course or, or not? You know, that's the basic question I have. So what if you do? are, if you are, then we probably you can tell the audience that, you know, it's coming in my future sessions, right? Uh, that so, way, those who don't understand the, the you know, advanced topics uh, are not lost. Okay, so usually what I can do is after I, these are Azure fundamentals, okay? There are a lot of good questions coming in. Looks like the audience are also know, I, I, the Vaishali and other people have uh, also shown, they seem to know a lot of these things. What I can do is after this session, I can talk about top five cloud architectures, okay? Where I can go into, I will take a, um, a hypothetical company uh, one could be a food delivery network, one could be a, a e-commerce site, and one could be, uh, you know, uh, some sort of a traditional banking system. I can walk through the architecture and connect all the dots. I can talk about five well-known architectures so that uh, it is useful for people to connect the dots. That yeah, I, I, right. yeah, that would be awesome. But that is that not a part of, you know, what I'm trying to get at is, uh, sorry, Krishna, to interrupt, right? So, okay. so if we... You know, I understand that some of the attendees here are advanced. They are asking some advanced questions. What I'm worried about is if we start running through those advanced answers for those advanced questions, which is going to anyways, you are going to cover in the future sessions. Uh, the the people who are not that advanced might get lost, right? So that's what I'm worried about. So two things uh, I always say. Uh, let me give an answer for you, right? No, so, no, just a minute. Sorry. So if you if you are going to cover that in future, so you can always say, hey, it's coming in the future sessions, I'll answer them. Or you can take this offline after the session to address those specific people. Um, that's that's my recommendation. So fair enough. Um, but I also say, right, these are the opportunities that um, somebody could take a note and then hit um, and then start building the knowledge rate. Because in cloud, the knowledge is not sequential. OK, so you cannot learn one, two, three, four, five. You might learn one, five, six, and then you connect all the dots. Uh, for example, if somebody listened to the conversation today, they could have learned about jump box versus Bastion, right? So I understand what you mean. It's uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, if you are not able to catch up, you can always post the question. Uh, it's always the the cloud learning is parallel, right? You might learn bits and pieces here, and then you might do a own research. In the end of the day, you'll learn, you'll know one to ten, but you might not go one, two, three, four, five. You might go one, six, ten, and then you have a big, big picture of it. Agreed, agreed. I'll Krishna. leave it to your uh, your uh, best judge and to balance it. No, Krishna. very valid. Right, uh, just, uh, just my thought process. Um, so just uh, one more second. Uh, I know that a couple of people reached out to me why I cannot see the chat. Uh, so I kind of uh, mentioned earlier, starting of the session itself, if you have not logged in into the Microsoft Teams as a, with, a, with your Testoper account, and if you click the link uh, that I sent to join, then you will join as a guest. So if you join as a guest, Without logging in into the Microsoft Teams of Testoper, you will not see the chat. So just make sure next time you 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 know there's a document for you to follow. I have posted in the 
Microsoft Teams. Just make sure you, you follow them next time. Um, sorry, Krishna, to hijack. You know, there was three no, or no, four no, people no. reached out to me on that, uh, so I had to jump in. Adarsh, over to you. Uh, like I was talking to you, I might have to, uh, you know, uh, hand over yeah. the session to you for the closure. Yeah. Okay, over to Krishna. You, Krishna. Yeah. Uh, Krishna, like if we are uh, starting in just two minutes, I just have a fun question. Like, uh, if we go into like the AWS website or something, like they pop up all these used cases like Netflix or anything yep. that is using the AWS system. Yes. I didn't see such a thing on the Azure portal. Like it's not a question, like a technical question, but just in case, like, do you know why Microsoft is not bringing up all these uh, famous e-commerce or other uh, portals that are using the Azure system? Or the Azure uh, I think uh, the best expert on this one is Mithatasha. That's his bread and butter of our last five okay. years. Let me talk about. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, that was that was Vaishali, is it? No, that, that was uh, Sonali. Who was it? Sorry. Sonali, yeah. Hi. Sonali, so let me just post a link which has all our customer stories. I know the way AWS does a little different than us. Uh, our Azure.com website is very service oriented versus our customer stories website is very customer stories oriented. I'm just going to post a link on all the famous customer stories that we have. Yeah, I think that's what probably Pankaj was also looking at uh, yeah. because the AWS does such huge marketing with who uses AWS. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe we want to look at that side also with the show. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, we definitely need to do a much better job, but uh, we. No, 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 I'm not saying about Microsoft. I'm saying about for us as users to understand. Yeah. Don't yeah. get me wrong there. No, no, it's completely fine. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm just posted a link about all our customer case studies. You can actually look into some of those case studies and see based on what you need. So do, you can select your industries, you can select your customer locations, and then you can see what case studies we have out there. Okay, yeah. So Adobe, Drive Time, Johnson, HP. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I got the picture. And we have tons of them. So what I will do is once I finish uh, Logical End, maybe next week or week after, depending on the availability of the people here, I can walk through the well-known use cases. Um, that's also part of the learning too, right? So yeah. that's, I can walk you through because that's a very good question. So uh, thank you very much for the question. So I'm going to jump into the container world, okay? So uh, which is Kubernetes. Um, Couple of things before I go into the technical details of it, I really want to understand. I want to explain where this whole notion of containers uh, originated. You know, from where it came in. On that context, I really want to. If you guys can see my screen, if we have uh, some time, I would just say, you know what? Let me. There's a book which came few years ago. It's called The Box. It talks about how the, the shipping containers change the the way we consume goods. Uh, how uh, after the after after the box came in, how it uh, changed the entire world of uh, global trade. Okay, so the reason I'm bringing that is it's very relevant to the topic we're going to talk about, which is containers. On so I, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Before and post container world and before container world. Traditionally, what happens when the ships, uh, the goods has to be moved across, I think geographies or moving from one port to other port, they tend to be uh, loaded onto in a haphazard manner, right? You you keep, for example, you might moving a, a ton of clothes and you might moving some a couple of uh, you know um, um, goods. It's all be in, in an unstructured in a, in a not uh, in a cohesive manner. What happens with that is you're not able to get efficiency of scale. So when the shipping container came in, you might have shipped a shipping container. It basically changed the way the global commerce is done, right? Um, so if it, if you see today, you might be seeing, uh, you might see a huge shipping container which is getting all the goods in. Um, so what the containers gave the world is a very standardized approach uh, for moving uh, goods between uh, point A to point B in a super efficient manner. Uh, first and foremost is transportation becomes extremely easy. For example, you can host a container into a into a big big truck uh, from the port into the consuming uh, sections. Uh, you can move the containers in a train. You can move the container using ships. It doesn't matter. So basically, mobility become a huge huge advantage, and that also led to one major advance, um, advancement is able to, which means the commerce increase substantially higher, right? 
So this is the origin of the container. If you think about why we keep seeing containers all the time, um, the symbols is basically the whole container ecosystem is from that particular concept. Um, I think last week there was a question came in, you know what? Um, why, what's the difference between, um, the, I'm, I'm comparing a difference between a physical container Docker. So, so Docker is basically one type of container. Things have changed, but Docker is very, very well known. Uh, I'm going to just run through the, uh, the, the reason for one is content agnostic. Um, in traditionally speaking, uh, a container doesn't care about what's inside the, what type of payload it is. It could be a Java payload. It could be a .NET payload. It could be a Node.js payload. Payload doesn't matter to at all. So what that means is it can ship your containers across any system as long as it's able to run on it, which means from a development and testing and production cycle, it's simple. All you need to push the container into the target environment as long as the runtime available, you can run it. So containers, uh, it's hardware agnostic. So that's why if you see there's a whole, there's a whole notion of uh, customers adopting container at a massive scale because it's extremely hardware agnostic. For example, a developer could build their application code in or into the laptop and then port that same container into say Google using GKE and also same do the same thing on uh, Azure and AWS. So far as the, the container doesn't care about what is the underlying uh, um, hardware or software running on it. Second one is isolation, right? So which isolation uh, is one something which basically is very, very key. For example, one example I gave you is there is no, if you think about uh, isolation, it, a container has got its own resources, it's got its own networks, and also there is no dependency. It also removes all the dependency. So this is uh, uh, Kadir was asking about uh, difference between monolithic uh, architecture and the non-monolithic architecture, right? So what happens with monolithic architecture is so you have to have a lot of dependency done across all this, um, all the components running into it, and that created so much dependency in terms of the application how it is running there. So other other point is automation. Um, CI/CD is a very commonly used mechanism now. So what happens with CI/CD is um, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Containers make it very 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 easy. Uh, scaling becomes a native service. So what happens when you have scaling is you can scale a container because containers are traditional or are stateless. Okay. So what happens with because they're stateless, they can scale out at exponentially faster pace than a traditional uh, machine type based systems. Um, so and also the last point is separation of duties, which is very very key. Uh, in this scenario, what happens is. A developer doesn't need to worry about any of the code. Uh, uh, he needs to worry, or worry about only the code. He doesn't care about what is the infrastructure is running on. So this is the major key points about the container. So let's go into the next key piece, which is the DevOps. Okay, I know I'm jumping a little bit off on the other side. Um, so you keep hearing um, DevOps quite consistently on the cloud world. Uh, the first and foremost is um, it makes DevOps easy because in the DevOps world, the the more repeatable the processes are. It, it makes things easier in terms of uh, running the system consistently. Um, the quality of the code by developers also very increased significantly because um, you, you might have heard of an agile process where the code is constantly built, the code is constantly updated, the code is auto constantly checked in, so which means the bugs, red bugs reduce significantly in comparative to the traditional ways. Uh, so also, and also one of the major challenges you always notice is you might build a piece of code in a non-prod environment, and then you try to deploy them into the production one, things would break because the environment is a very different. Hey, on the production, I have this type of uh, machine, and this is the network configuration, and the non-prod, you might have a different configuration, right? Imagine a scenario where um, if you do that on a consistent, if, you, if this issues happen constantly, that's why companies tend to have like a two weeks downtime for updating this new change, changes. On the new world, there's nothing called downtime. Const things are constantly being updated, right? The last one is um, containers by itself are very, very light in terms of what they have. They have a very small footprint. From the co cost benefit perspective, uh, it's much more efficient running containers versus uh, any traditional uh, virtual machine based systems. Um, hey, other, other point I want to mention is uh, 
in terms of um, containers, we used to have only Linux containers. Now we have both Windows and Linux containers. They can run side by side. Um, so Linux uh, containers have been uh, for quite a number of years and um, Windows is also starting to support containers. As of today, if you have Windows 10 machines, you can run a bash uh, type uh, system to run host containers on Azure. So, so containers on prem too. So again, I'm going to give you a very quick example of uh, what these differences are. If you think about traditional virtual machine, they are based out of hardware virtualization. What we mean by that is there's a, there's a physical hardware running underneath it. You're running multiple virtual machines on top of it, which means you are basically you are you're not able to pack whole bunch of uh, of virtual machines because the, each hardware has got a certain amount of threshold, uh, which means you are basically constrained by the underlying hardware's capability. When it comes to containers, what you end up doing is you would have multiple. You don't have a, a abstraction layer. If you, as you can see on the traditional uh, virtualization, you have a single operating system and there's a kernel and application, pretty, pretty much all the containers can be run on top of it with a very, very small footprint. And it's uh, this, uh, it's, uh, this another way of explaining uh, to how the containers are working. Traditionally, virtual machines layer have a hypervisor layer on top of it. In this scenario on containers, you have a Docker engine, which would basically the uh, the layer between your containers and the operating system. It also means is you have a very less number of uh, services that are running on the on the containers container station where it also gives you high performance throughput because you are reducing the number of components that are running on to this one. So basically, for example, if you think about a virtual machine, they are nothing more than a fully host, full uh, guest operating system, right? Uh, it's got uh, resources, it's got storage, it's got memory. Um, so it's got a lot of other, uh, I would say, uh, com components which will make you run the virtual machine. On, on the containers, basically what happens is it runs natively on the Linux or Windows, and it takes the kernel of the host machine, and it runs uh, processes on top of it without taking any more memory. So basically, if you heard of time slicing, uh, those are the concepts. Basically, containers are basically using the, the slice of the compute memory resource to optimize in an optimized fashion. So you run, you are able to run that particular workload on the containers with less footprint. So this one brings me to uh, uh, one of the disadvantage of a traditional virtual machine is um, very low utilization. You might have a huge server. But in the end, you end up running only two virtual machines because you are basically hosting a full entire virtual machine on top of it. Um, and especially if you're using containers, what happens is, as you can see, on the same virtual machine, you can pack in more containers onto the VM, which means on the, sa the same workload, which the same server components, which used to run two virtual machines, now we can run four containers. Basically, you're able to compact more um, workload within the same one because of the how the containers are engineered to work with. I'm just going to build a slide. As you can see, one of the other advantages, as I mentioned earlier, is um, you can also ready it also reduces your need for resources because instead of running two machines having two containers each, you can have a single virtual machine that can host multiple containers, which also reduces your footprint significantly. Which means that the more reduced footprint you have the higher performance you have in terms of uh, your application. Um, just again, uh, one of the, there are four major advantage of containers, what is agility, be able to ship your applications faster, uh, port, you can move your applications between uh, multiple environments from a non-prod to production to with significant ones, density, we call them one key aspect we spoke about is be able to compress, achieve more dense, you're able to use the compute layer so that you can have more density on that particular workload and also scale, the scaling out is a very, very key factor. I think during the previous uh, session, I think the question came in, how does companies like, uh, you know, the Walmarts of the world and other ones, um, e-commerce sites run it. So they, a lot of them are adopting uh, containers at massive scale. So what ends up happening is they're building containers based uh, solutions and that also reduces the time to market and also removes all the traditional challenges of virtual machine significantly. Um, I'm going to jump into uh, a key concept is called orchestration, right? Okay, containers by itself 
or basically uh, or would be able to host your workloads. But imagine if your containers also, because you're able to compact or compress a lot of containers into a single virtual machine, the scale is going to be huge. Let's say in containers, you might be running thousands of containers. You know, in that case, uh, you need a very good, strong orchestration engines. Okay, um, orchestration engine is basically means um, it should be able to do a couple of key things, right? Uh, how does this container is performing? What is the health uh, of this container? What is the failover? How does the scaling work? What are the networking? And what are the service discovery? And now how does the upgrade work, right? So this is again, uh, that's why your softwares like uh, Kubernetes, uh, you might heard DCOS, Docker Swarm. Um, there are other variations of the number one uh, Kubernetes platform, uh, number one orchestration engine is Kubernetes where. So these Kubernetes basically an orchestration platform. All it does do is, able to orchestrate huge volumes of containers and to give a single cohesive uh, application framework for your customers to work with. Um, I think I'm going to open up uh, the floor for the questions. So before I go into it, uh, any questions, uh, feel free uh, to post it to me now. There are not too many questions in the chat window. So if anyone has a question, if you guys can come off mute uh, and just ask, uh, it'll be great. Uh, you spoke about um, Windows containers. Uh, how are they different from uh, Docker containers? So Windows containers takes uh, what we had. We I can share you our initial white paper on it. That's a very, very deep uh, discussion there. So what basically what we had done is we had taken some elements of the Linux world and we built a chain the kernel to adopt to the container world, right? Because traditionally Windows didn't host any containers. As you know, we we took some of the components from the Linux world. That's where your kernels have been updated to adopt uh, the con uh, to host containers on Azure on a Windows machine. I can share the white paper for that as well. Uh, please do so. And um, uh, I forgot my question. Actually, uh, just to sorry, uh, because if you see uh, Windows used to have a uh, long time ago, um, we call them app engine or something where you're able to host content like features on Azure. So sorry on, on on Windows. So there is a I can share I can share the details on a white paper. That's a very deep conversation. Thank you. So I know this is a very deep. Uh, this topic is going to be very deep, but I think uh, please uh, you know bear with me for a few minutes. Uh, I really want to get this concept across to the team because uh, if you think about it today, at this point in time, Kubernetes is going to be one of the widely used systems. So most other stuff, if you don't know Kubernetes, you might be in a challenging situation, but I'm going to walk you through how the Kubernetes is working, right? So very simple, give me five minutes, I'll cover the basics here. Um, so the, basically the key concept in, uh, in Kubernetes, we call them as the API server. So think about API servers are basically uh, an endpoint um, which basically will help you to orchestrate your workloads. Uh, basically, that's a core engine, which is going to be used by uh, the Kubernetes system to manage. API, if you keep, uh, one of the key, key thing always keep hearing is API servers. So what happens at the HCD, which is a database, uh, any type of, intra, it's a database. It's a distributed database. Uh, it's an interesting thing about the distributed database is, um, it's a song, single source of truth for all actions that are happening on a Kubernetes system. Um, and within that Kubernetes, we have a scheduler, uh, which basically schedules a job, and we have also some controller, right? The controller, think about um, what are the replication namespaces and other components that makes the controller here. And we have worker nodes. Worker nodes are basically where you run your workload. Uh, this could be your, you know, your, uh, your your order processing system, or not the whole system. Where simple payment gateways, it could be a very co simple components you might be running on the worker nodes. And the pods are where basically where the containers are hosted at scale. So if you think about it, if it on a traditional uh, monolithic architectures, you know, where the everything is host installed on a, on a on a server, in in the Kubernetes world, what happens is they all install on a um, containers which are sits inside a pod. Think about pod as basically a bag of common containers uh, that are come that are put together to to do a single functionality respecting for it. For example, on the e-commerce sample we talked about, a yeah, one pod could be managing your uh, payment gateway. 
and other part could be managing your uh, your order processing and other part could be managing you know um, front end customer requests so think about parts are basically single uh, unified uh, uh, container or single unified uh, bag of containers that is used to um, so service a given uh, customer request um, and where these all gets into very interesting is uh, if you heard about kubernetes uh, it's a beast of a system and most customers especially large customers um, they have the challenge of uh, building and maintaining a kubernetes system at scale um, if you think about uh, kubernetes it's uh, you see all the components that are needed to orchestrate uh, the kubernetes so what happened with microsoft is and also other vendors is we started to build um, a fully baked in platform as a service uh, kubernetes system what happens is um, we build a multiple uh, layer security model i will show that what it is and one key challenge in kubernetes is uh, support okay most of the time when you um, adopt uh, open source software uh, what you end up doing is uh, supportability becomes a major challenge because as an example kubernetes tends to keep uh, have a very fast release cycle for example uh, now it's uh, if i am not mistaken is 1.18 is on the uh, so it's going to be getting ga very soon soon uh, don't quote me on it i might be wrong but i think uh, it's something around 1.18 so what they'll say is you know anything on over 1.5 and below one point is not supported anymore so which means enterprise customers have a lot of challenge in supportability so customers that are using azure will get full enterprise supportability for open for open source software um, and also there is a, if you think about ecosystem of kubernetes there are hundreds and thousands of different components customers are not able to run them at scale because each component will be varied uh, if you think about a classic example is you might know hadoop right uh, one of the challenges in the hadoop system is you might have hortonworks releasing a certain type of uh, product you might see cloudera releasing the same thing right so on that in this scenario both of them do the same build on hadoop but the way these guys manage the components are very different it also made the uh, life cycle of uh, hadoop is very complicated on same thing happening or happened on uh, on kubernetes but uh, custom companies like microsoft took the open source we built a very strong uh, layering on top of it one other key thing also microsoft does is we also always always check the code into the upstream what we mean by upstream is any bugs we find on the kubernetes platform we will we'll check that code we are a major contributor of the open source kubernetes we check the code in which means any releases coming to azure as an example will have the latest get fixes so which means from a customer point of view they don't need to keep uh, patching and fixing the system they need they can take care of the workload they're running on it so that's a whole difference in terms of the container kubernetes on azure and one other key thing is um so in summary uh, we have about thousands of uh, best practices from enterprises we baked into the platform because the platform is a service um, as you can see it's a 24 by 7 support 365 days uh, and also we have a whole bunch of engineering comp, uh, resources within Microsoft that are basically managing, building, and keeping this uh, AKS on Azure uh, at the top, as, as working constantly. Um, so, yeah, what are the components we have in Azure today is um, we have support for the CI CD, which is using Azure DevOps. We also build in native monitoring tools for containers. Um, we also have uh, Helm, which is the registry support. We also have source code repository using GitHub or Azure uh, Azure repo, and we also support uh, IDEs. For example, if you go to Visual Studio Code, we can start to see uh, specific IDEs uh, built for the case. And this gives a full picture of what it is now. On the left hand side, you can see the development tools, Visual Studio, GitHub, Azure Dev Spaces, uh, Container Registry, and Azure Monitor. On the right hand side, you can see the community support, right? So the Helm, the Visual, the Visual Kubelet, Drafts, uh, Brigade, extensions for VS Code, Service Mesh, Gatekeeper, the whole bunch of things, so ONI. On the middle area where you can see active, for example, when you host a container in Azure, uh, those all the AKS is directly in, in, integrated with Azure AD. It got Azure policies. Basically, Azure policies think about a policy system where you can enforce your security policy and governance layer on top of it. 
Um, obviously, Azure Security Center, uh, it's basically the framework of security across the AKS and also Key Vault, which is again uh, in in um, Kubernetes, you need to store the keys. We we have a native integration with uh, Key Vault and also other things go into it. And also one thing we have done is we worked with uh, Red Hat. So Red Hat is basically um, build their own um, uh, Kubernetes deployment on Azure, which is basically available as a fast service. Uh, our own service is called AKS, and the last piece is Azure Arc. So Azure Arc, is, think about Azure Arc as a single unified uh, monitoring layer that can connect with any type of Kubernetes service across. It doesn't matter whether you're running OpenShift or GKE or EKS. Azure Arc could be the single frame of uh, monitoring tool sets that you can monitor any type of Kubernetes deployment. Because given the fact Kubernetes is a standard across all the cloud platforms, uh, we are able to work with that because of the uh, open source model. I uh, have a question about um, Helm. Yes. Uh, so since uh, Helm is uh, sort of included in the Azure uh, Kubernetes service, uh, any Helm chart uh, developed under any other Kubernetes uh, system that supports Helm uh, can be imported and used? Yes. Okay, thanks. It's basically, again, that's uh, uh, because we use the standard um, Kubernetes, right? We support the same releases of Kubernetes. We match up what it is. So as long as Helm can work anywhere, um, you can basically Helms works on it as well. So that is a lot of engine. That's where the engineering effort goes into play. Where all the tools we provide is is can be used standard across all the Kubernetes releases of it. So uh, the uh, server side, the tiller side, also must be included then, right? Yep. So, but there also we do want some variations based on our needs. But pretty much uh, um, we support uh, the Helm two. We also support the Helm three, the new chart format. Um, so that is so yeah, the lot of things goes into it, and also sometimes we also give you migration support too, right? But uh, yeah, as you but might how, know, how does ahead. it uh, how does it uh, match with uh, the OC of uh, OpenShift? So OpenShift is a different platform. Uh, again, we don't really do one-on-one -on -one matching, but for us, is basically the open source version of uh, the component, right? Okay. OpenShift make a lot of changes according to the needs. But uh, again, that's a whole different conversation. I can catch up with you on the sidelines. Um, okay, thanks. There's a, bit, there's a bit of difference on it, but uh, we are partners with OpenShift. We also make sure that OpenShift, all the customization of OpenShift works on Azure too. So two offering for customers available on Azure. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, security becomes a major layer. Krishna, in this I'm case. sorry, a uh, slight time check. 12.23, seven minutes left. So if you want to wrap up and then five minutes of Q&A. And yep. then close. So I will finish. Uh, I, was thought, I was thinking of covering network, but I don't think so we have time. But I'll finish with, I think we're the right on time for the Kubernetes stuff. So um, again, uh, one aspect of AKS on Azure is the security layer, right? So, so I think security is one way which you, I'll constantly harbor about it because um, uh, Kubernetes tend to have a lot of, components that can be easily exposed or opened up um, for uh, that can pose security risks, starting with the app layer. You see in the top, um, so ingress controllers. How does uh, ingress controller makes uh, differences? For example, any type of traffic that are coming to your uh, uh, pods or containers has to be properly secured. So we give you a layer seven um, WAF, which is web application firewall. Um, which is seen as an ingress controller. We also have a concept like private link. Um, one of the challenges on when you're hosting a public pass service, it's it always has a public endpoint, okay? Uh, customers don't like it because you know what? Public endpoint could also mean anybody could from the um, internet can access it, but actually it's not a fact, but it gives you a public endpoint IP address, right? So customers don't like it. So what we end up building is a feature called private, private link. Private link is basically, uh, Think about a service that we make pass, like as if it's operating within your IP range, RFC 1918, which is uh, 10.172.192.192 IP addresses. It basically pass becomes your private endpoint at service. On top of that, um, we use uh, the master nodes, which is the controller, manager, scheduler, and APS or NCD. We all reside within an extremely highly secure Microsoft uh, core network. Nothing is exposed to this particular master node, uh, unless until uh, you explicitly ask for an access with a certain IP addresses, this master node is fully uh, in the backend. 
Um, on top of that, uh, our key product is Azure Security Center. So Azure Security Center is basically what it'll do is, is constantly audit your environment for any type of security things. For example, if you host a virtual machine, if you host up a, a port, the 3389, it'll keep auditing the 3389, who, what type of traffic is coming in. If you host um, a Linux machine, it's going to audit you against CIS standards. Um, that's, a, that's a whole conversation on Azure Security Center, but in short, we also make sure that um, Azure Security Center is constantly monitoring your, your environment. Um, and also we use persistent volumes. One of the uh, thing with the persistent volume, the keys may play a major role. To sum it all up, um, Active Directory is going to be the single encompassing identity model across the systems. So that's key understanding to know is I uh, we have multiple types of uh, um, authentication authorization system. All of them work through a single solution called Azure AD. Um, and also the last piece, Express Route, which uh, which is basically MPLS network. Um, when you host any AKS clusters today, that can be directly connected to Azure using a private link from your on-premises. So this is a very quick uh, summary of it. Um, uh, I think this brings to our four minutes left. Uh, I'll open up the section the 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 for Q and A. Guys, the only thing I would want to say is that what Krishna just explained is actually very, it's quite complex. So completely understandable if uh, a lot of you did not. Uh, you you will need to go. You will need to spend some time to really understand this core concept of the shift from uh, VMs to containers, and then how do you orchestrate all the containers? So it takes a little time. So don't feel overwhelmed by all this information that Krishna shares. We will be here every two weeks to answer questions. And uh, for some of the sessions, what we can also do, and just throwing an option out there for you guys is, we can host something called as an AMA session, which is like ask me anything kind of a session, wherein we can you know, focus on just specific questions you guys have. Uh, we can we, we can explore those options if that's something you know uh, a lot of you would want. So we'll ask Kadir and you know Sen and everyone to figure out how we can actually manage those things. But we are essentially here to help you guys skill up and learn a lot of these uh, interesting skills which are coming up in the market. And so if at all you guys have any feedback on how we can make this better, please let us know. Um, and and if at all you have any questions right now for Krishna, please feel free to get off mute and ask. <clears throat> Uh, so I have a question. The Active Directory and all uh, would be uh, managed at a resource group level, or like uh, so? How do we? So the uh, that's a good question. So AD is basically integrated at a subscription level. Like um, resource group will get an inheritance of that. So basically, uh, you when you enable a subscription, uh, it is done at the subscription level, not at a resource group level. Okay, so basically all the resource groups under uh, subscription will have the same AD then, right? Yes, yes. You can always yeah. have multiple ADs, but uh, it's you tell you best practice you always have one AD directly, yes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> One last thing I wanted to say out here is that if some of you are thinking about pursuing any certifications around Azure Fundamentals or Azure DevOps or Data and AI or anything, uh, Azure Developer Certifications, definitely reach out to me. I'm going to post my email address out here. We do, we may have, I can commit to this because these are primarily for our customers directly. Uh, but do reach out to us on uh, on this email ID, which I just posted out here. We can try and get you guys some discounts on some certification vouchers that we may have. But right now, just, just reach out to me. We'll figure out something. So one of the options is directly reaching out to me. The second option is the way certification vouchers really work is that we give a bulk of certification vouchers to our customers, and then the customers give it to their employees for them to you know skill up. And that is the primary route we go through. So if at all, you can reach out to me. Hey, I belong to this particular company, and I'm interested in this particular certification. I can find out, A, if your customer, or as in if your company already has a certification vouchers from us, then that's the best and easiest route. And if not, I can try and figure out if I can get you some vouchers. 
So I'm just letting everyone know out here if that's of interest, we can do that. The second thing is if any of your companies would want to explore certain options around how to adopt some of these services, how to think about transformation, do let us know. Uh, we'll be more than happy to have those conversations too. Hi, Adish, this is Sonali. Just one question regarding this vouchers. So like, let's say, assume uh, we, we don't want, we want to get the certification, but maybe not now in like two months, three months, four months. So like, would you be still considering that? Yeah, definitely reach out to me. So a simple thing, the way Microsoft works is our fiscal or financial year goes from July to June. So right now the certification vouchers which are available with us will expire by June 30th. But then as soon as July 1st kicks in, we'll have new set of vouchers. That's how our fiscal works, correct? So mm -hmm. generally when we give out vouchers, it has an expiration date about for six months, generally speaking. But then reach out to us whenever you have any requirement. We'll try and figure out some way to support. Thanks. Uh, one one quick question on uh, uh, for, for those uh, who develop microservices, uh, wh what are the AKS features that they should be aware of? So I can uh, I can share you a practice on it. So basically, you want to understand what are the features that that on the AKS available for building microservices. Right? That's a question, right? Yeah. Uh, there's a white paper on it. Uh, if you can, I will share it using the chat window here once I finish the session. Um, so yes, it's that's there. We have we have quite a bit of best practices on that as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, on that note, uh, it's 12.32. We are good to close the sessions. If at all you guys have any questions, feel free to post the questions on the Teams uh, channel. Uh, we will definitely keep a watch out on the discussion and all the questions that you guys may have there. Uh, and we will keep in touch. Uh, every two weeks, the session is going to go on. If at all you guys have any certain requests for certain topics that you may be interested in, definitely reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to share our learnings and see how we can support. So, uh, just one question. So, this is the end of Kubernetes, or next uh, session we are going to continue something? So, I think next, uh, the whole idea was to, uh, to give you uh, a flavor of Kubernetes and containers to get you guys started on. The reason I brought that is because uh, the fundamental course doesn't talk about depth in about the Kubernetes, but I really wanted to showcase to the team that uh, they have to start looking at uh, containers. So, we we can have, a, we will have another session for AKS deep dive, but next week I really want to focus on networking aspects of it and also get you guys on a lab side of things. But uh, if you have any questions on Kubernetes, you can always reach out to me um, or, you know, through the channel or you know through my LinkedIn as well. More than happy to help you. Um, Adasha, there's one question. Uh, does it answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah. OK, uh, there was one question. Is there any career transition possible from a JS developer to Azure technologist? I'm a JS developer. How long it will, will it require? Adasha, do you, do you want to take that in? Where is that question? I think I missed it. It's on uh, it's on the WhatsApp from a Josh uh, Joshi George. Um, oh, okay. So how to move from a JS developer to Azure technology? Yeah, so um, Azure is think about Azure as like a platform. So we do support uh, all languages, starting from JS, starting from C sharp. All open sources are actually supported. So let me share some links with you guys. So as long as you know a language, think about Azure as a platform on which you'll be developing and hosting, right? So irrespective of what your language and skills are, it will be supported on Azure. Think about Azure at the basic level being the infrastructure hosting layer on which you will be developing applications. So irrespective of whether you de develop your application on JavaScript or on Java or on C Sharp or on .NET or, or these days even on Go or Rust or any of those languages, all of that will be supported. One of the very interesting things which um, which Krishna just spoke about is uh, containers, right? Containers makes it language independent and dependency independent. Oh, that <laughs> dependency independent sounded very, it, it basically makes it uh, completely uh, mobile, uh, like, like mobility is the biggest aspect. So whether you write your application on Java or anything, it will be supported across all the containers or even VMs or things like that. So I know you're coming to the very end, but I think, uh, guys, if you have any feedback, uh, please be honest in terms of what should I do better, whether I should uh, add something or reduce something, more than happy, because the 
the whole idea of this session is to for you to can you spend two hours to get value out of it. Uh, feel free uh, to share your comments and feedback. We are more than I'm more than happy to tweak my style, or if you want to go fast, slow, uh, I will try and uh, be more uh, you know considered on that aspect. Also. But thanks for your time. Really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, feel free to connect me through this chat channel or you know to the teams. I also have a LinkedIn profile. If you need to have any questions, feel free. Uh, we host the session just for your benefit, nothing else. Um, so thanks for Kadir and uh, Adarsha for supporting us and also all the questions coming in. There is no question. Uh, ask any questions you need to ask on the cloud world. More than happy to answer your questions. Thank you guys. Have a nice week ahead. Have a nice weekend, guys. And one last thing is that Link actually has pretty interesting material and coursework for you guys to, if at all you guys want to reference something and skill up by yourself. It's very self-paced. It can be done on your own chance, so feel free to use that. All right, thank you so much, guys. We can close this call. Thank you. Kadir, any last, uh, you want to close out or are we okay? Uh, Adarsha, you're oh, supposed to share left. Your Sorry. Email. Okay, guys. Thank Kadir. you, guys. All right. Adarsha. Thank you. Hello, yeah. Adarsha, yeah. you're supposed to share your email ID. I did. It's uh, there, adarsha.data at testopa.com. Oh, okay, because uh, we are not able to see the chat today. Oh, okay. You want me to post it on the WhatsApp? On the WhatsApp, yeah, please. Yeah, I'm just going to post it there. Yeah. No Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Guys. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Krishna. Bye. 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 Thank you.